Hi, my name is Daryl Peterson and I'm the manager of the Applications Engineering Department here at MicroMeasurements. This afternoon I'd like to take a few minutes and go through a strain gauge installation on something you might not expect, which happens to be a 3.7 volt lithium battery. Back many years ago when I started with MicroMeasurements, one of the first applications I got involved with were space batteries. There was a company that made this container that was essentially a pressure vessel that the batteries would go inside. And the way that uh, they would monitor the health of these batteries is monitoring the pressure of that containment vessel. And the way that they did that was they bonded a set of our CEA series strain gauges on the outside of this pressure vessel and they would monitor it and as the pressure would go down, the strains would reduce and that gave them an indication of the health of the battery. In this case, we're gonna put one of the MicroMeasurements three element rosettes on this small lithium battery, and we'll see if we can use it to monitor the health of this little lithium battery. Now, the strain gauge that we're gonna use is one of the MicroMeasurements C5K series strain gauges. This C5K series gauge, you'll notice, is pre-cabled. Uh, this particular one has nine feet of a 36 gauge Teflon wire pre-attached to the gauge. It also happens to be a three element rosette. And what that basically means is that it's got three sensitive grids that allow us to solve for our unknowns in our strain field, which happens to be our maximum and minimum principal strain and direction. Now, along with putting on this three element rosette, we're also gonna install a nickel sensor, and these nickel sensors will be used to sense the temperature. So we're gonna put a strain gauge and a nickel sensor onto this 3.7 volt lithium battery, and we'll monitor its health. We'll take it through a variety of different conditions and we'll see how these strain gauges and that temperature sensor respond as we expose it to those different environmental conditions. But first, we have to get the strain gauge and the temperature sensor installed and that's what we'll work on now. Okay, so the first part of installing a strain gauge, really on any part, is gonna be the surface preparation. And this is a key part of um, making sure that you get good quality strain gauge measurements. Uh, it's important for you to use the right types of adhesive. It's important for you to use the right types of chemicals to get the surface clean. We're gonna use the, the M-Line micro measurements uh, materials that uh, we recommend for cleaning the surface. Uh, I believe this surface uh, uh, looks to be aluminum, so we're gonna follow the steps normally that we outline for prepping the surface for aluminum. In this case, I'm gonna use uh, the M-Line GC6 uh, isopropyl alcohol as a solvent to uh, degrease it. Once I do that, I'm gonna use some silicon carbide paper to abrade the surface, to give it a little texture for bonding. Uh, then I'm gonna scrub it using the M-Prep conditioner. The, we call it the red tip bottle, the M-Prep conditioner. It's a mild phosphoric acid that helps to chemically etch and clean. And then lastly, we'll use the M-Prep neutralizer uh, this is an ammonia-based solution that'll help to bring the pH back up to an acceptable level uh, for all of our adhesive systems. Some are a little more sensitive than others. We're going to be using the M-Bond AE10 uh, two-part epoxy. Uh, it's not quite as sensitive to the surface pH, but still we're going to make sure it's at the right level uh, for bonding. This is a two-part epoxy system that'll cure at room temperature. Once we mix it up, we got about 20 minutes to use it. Uh, and then we clamp it up and we let it sit overnight and at room temperature, this AE10 will cure uh, in about six hours. And again, we'll just let it go overnight. But before we get to that, we're gonna get started with the surface cleaning. So I'm gonna locate the, the GC6, the isopropyl alcohol. I'll take a gauze pad and just kind of fold it up, pour a little bit into the gauze pad, move this other battery out of the way and just try to clean off all the surfaces of this battery. It's pretty small, so it's pretty easy to, uh, to get it clean, and it's already sort of starting out from a pretty clean condition in the beginning anyway. I think the biggest thing here is we pulled the, some of the labeling off of it, the sticker that was on it. 
So we want to make sure we get all that mastic off of it that could prevent the uh, strain gauge adhesive from sticking. So just a good uh, degreasing. Now we're going to put the strain gauge in about the center of this battery, the strain gauge and the uh, 50 ohm nickel temperature sensor. I'll put the isopropyl alcohol up. And now I'm just going to braid back and forth about 10 or 12 strokes on the aluminum. Here all we're trying to do is give it a little bit of surface texture. I'm going to go one way with it and maybe turn around and go the opposite direction with it. And you can see that really what we're trying to do is give it some of that texture for bonding just to make sure that we have a nice dull finish. If you look at that side, then I flip it over and look at that side, you can see that that's nice and shiny. This one's nice and dull and that's exactly what we're chasing after. Now, once we've done that, the next step is to wet a braid and this time we're gonna, we're gonna use a little bit of uh, the conditioner and another piece of that silicon carbide paper. I'll just use a few drops on it. Another piece, I'll take it and fold it. This time, maybe not quite as aggressive, but just a few strokes back and forth. Maybe eight to 10. And now I'll take one of these gauze pads, fold it and then fold it again. Start kind of inside the cleaned area, wipe out, and then start again in, also inside that cleaned area and wipe the other direction. So we've degreased it, we've abraded it, we've done a wet abrade. The next step is to scrub it. This time we're gonna scrub it using the Imprep conditioner and some of these cotton tip applicators. So I'm gonna use these cotton tip applicators, which are basically Q-tips with a wooden handle. Again, I'll take the conditioner, a few drops. I'm gonna scrub this whole area. Now I'll flip it over to the other side and scrub it until it comes up clean. Now this is an etchant, so a lot of times it'll turn it just a little bit gray, uh, but that looks really good. I'll take another gauze pad and fold it, fold it again. Inside the cleaned area wipe, same side, same location, go in the opposite direction. All right, and we're almost done with the surface cleaning. The last step is to use the Imprep Neutralizer. That's the blue tip bottle. I'm gonna make sure I'm working on a, a clean dry sheet of paper. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna throw this one away. And I'll take the neutralizer, open the neutralizer up, put a few drops of it. Again, this is the ammonia-based solution. Another cotton tip applicator. And scrub that area. Once I'm happy with that, one more gauze pad folded inside the cleaned area. Take it, refold it, or get a clean side of it, go in the opposite direction, dry off the underside. And that's really it. So we've degreased it, abraded it, conditioned it, neutralized it. So really at this point, this is ready for bonding. So we're at, a, we're at a, a stopping point in terms of the surface preparation. The next phase of this installation is to prep our strain gauge and get it ready for bonding. Now, in order to do that, I'm gonna take the battery and just move it to the side, and I'm gonna use a piece of glass. We like to recommend that you lay the gauge out on a piece of glass because A, it's, uh, it's not porous, so it won't leach materials into it, and secondly, you can easily tell whenever it's dirty. And we need to do a little bit of house cleaning. If you look at this one, you can see a little bit on the surface. Uh, also, I'm gonna locate my blunt nose tweezers. These are great for handling the strain gauges. If you look at the tips of them, you'll notice they're nice and rounded to try to reduce the risk of damaging the strain gauge while you're handling it. Uh, but I'm gonna clean the glass off and clean the tweezers off. And in order to do that, I'm gonna again use the Imprep neutralizer uh, just a couple of drops and another gauze pad and I'll just wipe off the surface of the glass 
and I'll take the same gauze pad and wipe off the tips of the tweezers. So now I've got a nice uh, clean dry surface that's going to come in contact with the strain gauge. I've got the part as well ready for bonding. So the next step of this is to locate the strain gauge. This is where I'm going to use the three element rosette, the C5K06 S5198 350-39F. Again, this one has nine feet of a 36 gauge Teflon wire pre-attached to it. So it really makes the installation much faster, much easier, and much smaller than a typical strain gauge installation. In particular, when you're working on things like electronic components where you've got small tight spaces, this is the type of strain gauge that we would typically uh, recommend that you consider using. Now, in order to, to uh, open the package, you gotta tear this uh, little plastic sleeve off. One of the things I'd like to mention to you is that uh, if you order strain gauges, there is no shelf life associated with them. So when you get the strain gauges in, if you don't need them, if you've got some extra, just leave that plastic seal on them, put them over in a clean, dry environment like a lab uh, desk drawer or your desk drawer in your office, and uh, they'll be good for many years to come. All of your technical information is contained on this package. Your resistance, the temperature coefficient, a gauge factor, the gauge factor itself, transverse sensitivity, all the thermal output characteristics, the foil lot, all of that is contained on this package. So when you get your strain gauges in, one of the things you want to do is document that information. You could either, if you had a barcode reader, you could shoot this 2D barcode and import that into a spreadsheet, or you can simply just take a picture of it with your cell phone and store it in a nice, safe place because you don't need all this technical data while you're installing the strain gauge, but you do need all this technical data when you get ready to connect it into your electronics. So that being said, I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna take the strain gauge out. I'm gonna take the package and close it back up. Put it over out of harm's way. Again, we're gonna need that later. And I'm gonna take the strain gauge, take this rubber band off and the strain gauge is in this little uh, folder that is stuck onto this little piece of chipboard. And what I'm gonna do is take this strain gauge out and kind of lay it onto the piece of glass. Sometimes what you'll find is that the wires will be telling the strain gauge what to do. And when that's the case, sort of like here, I like to take a little small piece of our gauge installation tape and put it over top of the wires just to help hold things down in place while you're trying to, to get everything positioned and ready. So I'll just put that down over top of it. Now the other thing that we want to do with this exercise is we want to have a temperature sensing uh, channel as well. So what I'm gonna do is find one of my uh, 50 ohm nickel uh, temperature sensors I'm gonna take that out and I'm gonna lay it right up next to that strain gauge. So when I use a piece of uh, gauge installation tape, I'm gonna capture that temperature sensor uh, and the strain sensitivity uh, with the same piece of tape. And the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that what I'm gonna use for clamping will end up clamping both of them. And I'm gonna use these little red rubber pads to do that. So I'm just kind of looking at it, seeing how close I need to get it. Because, you know, when you're using a temperature sensor to maybe correct for thermal output from strain gauges, you need to have that temperature sensor very close to the location of the gauge. And here I've got it close, and also um, I've got it to where this one rubber pad would actually clamp uh, both of them. So once I have that in place, I'm gonna take another piece of the uh, gauge installation tape. Now, in general, whenever you're taking this gauge installation tape, it's a good idea to take a few inches of it, tear it off, and throw it away, because sometimes it'll be bouncing around in your toolbox and it'll pick up some dust. But once you've done that, then you can take another piece of it, let's say that's about four or five inches long, tear that off. And what I like to do is kind of fold the end over like that to give me a little bit of a handle. 
And then I'm going to try to capture both the gauge and that temperature sensor at the same time with that piece of tape. And now what I should be able to do is lift up this piece of tape and now I've got both of them and I'll transfer them over to the clean surface of the battery. And at this point, we're ready to go ahead and do that. So I'm happy with the positioning of that. I'll bring the battery back over. We're gonna put the gauge and the temperature sensor about in the middle. So once I get past the strain gauge, then I can go ahead and lift it on up. Try to make sure that the tape and the temperature sensor both come up at the same time. There we go. And now we're gonna transfer it over. And wipe it back down into place. Now the tricky part of this is that as long as we don't wrinkle this piece of tape, the strain gauge and the temperature sensor will go right back into, into the same location. The next part of this will be handling the two-part epoxy. Okay, so now we're ready to handle the adhesive we're gonna to use to, to glue the strain gauge and the temperature sensor down onto the battery. Uh, and for that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna use the Embond AE10. Uh, it's a two-part epoxy system. I'll show you how to use it. It's pretty, pretty simple and easy to use. One of the great things about it is that it, it cures at room temperature. Uh, it does require clamping pressure, so we're gonna put some pressure on it, let it sit um, overnight in this case. Uh, if you wanted to speed up the, the curing process at room temperature, it takes about six hours. But if you elevate the temperature, you'll find you can cure it much faster. If you get it up around 150 Fahrenheit, you could actually cure it uh, in less than an hour. What we're going to do is just cure it at room temperature. So I'm going to uh, open the kit up. We've got a jar of resin and a small bottle of the Embon Type 10 uh, curing agent. I'll just move the glass out of the way because we don't need it anymore. Uh, along with the kit, you'll get some plastic packaging that has um, one of these little bellow type pipettes in it and also a plastic uh, stirring rod. And I'll go ahead and take that out now as well. Now, with this epoxy system, uh, we're gonna mix it up in this jar. And once we mix it up, we got basically about 20 minutes to use it. And after that, it'll turn into a solid, uh, much like this one. You see this one's got the plastic stirring rod in it. You'll notice that it's a solid, and that's really what we're chasing after. If it's not a solid after about a half of an hour, uh, potentially we've got a problem with the mix of that epoxy system. So in order to mix this though, I'm gonna take the cap off the resin, and I'm not gonna need it, so I'll just take that and toss that to the side. And then I've got the curing agent. <clears throat> I'll take the cap off of it. Make sure you put the cap back on it because the curing agent does like to absorb moisture, so we wanna make sure we minimize how much time uh, that we use it without it. And this dropper, it's kinda of hard to see in a camera, but we've got a, a one half, a one, and a 1.5 milliliter amount. And for this AE10, we're looking at the 1.5 milliliter amount. I'm gonna squeeze the air out of it, pull it up to the, get the air out of it again, pull it up to the 1.5 milliliter amount, and then I'll squeeze it into the jar of resin. I'll take that dropper. I'm not gonna need that anymore, throw that away. Again, as I mentioned, put the cap back on the curing agent. I'll put that back in the rest of the kit for later. And then I'll take the plastic stirring rod and start mixing. And right now we're at 315, so I need to mix it for five minutes. So we'll go to 320. And as you start mixing it, try to hold the, the AE10 by the thread so you don't add any heat. It is an exothermic reaction. And if you kind of hold it in the palm of your hand like this, you can kind of reduce the amount of time you got to work with it. So just hold it by the threads 
and then stir the epoxy. And don't worry about whipping bubbles into it. I don't know how well you can see that in the camera, but it's all right, we'll take care of that in a few minutes. Now we got five minutes of mixing. Okay, so we've uh, mixed that AE10 for five minutes. And basically now we're at the point uh, where we're ready to finish out this installation at least as much as we can do uh, this afternoon. So what we're gonna do is take the tape and lift the tape at a shallow angle until we get past the strain gauge and the temperature sensor and just kind of peel that back ever so slightly. And I'm gonna take a gauze pad and just kind of wipe off this plastic stirring rod. Sometimes you get a little bit of curing agent or resin that kind of clings to it. So it's what you're gonna to use to apply it. So it's a good idea to, to uh, clean that off. And then I'll take just a single drop, apply that on the bonding side of the string gauge and on the bonding side of the um, temperature sensor. I'll take another drop or two of this epoxy and apply it onto the surface of the battery. This is where, this is what helps to make sure that we don't get any air trapped underneath it is to wet both surfaces, the bonding side of the gauge and the bonding side of the uh, part. So now I've got plenty of epoxy on it. Uh, I got a little bit of time with AE10. Uh, I got a few minutes here I can move around. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take another gauze pad, fold it up, and just hold the gauge over and the, the temperature sensor over and just wipe it down into place. Now as I wipe it, I'm also gonna wipe the epoxy off the edge because you know I've got really way more epoxy on it than what I really need. Um, and it's a lot easier to wipe it off now than it is once it's cured because then it should not wipe off. Now, once I've got it in place and I'm happy with that, the next thing I'm gonna do is put my rubber pad in place over top of the strain gauge and the temperature sensor. And then I'm gonna put a metal plate over top of that. And then last but not least, I'm gonna clamp it. So here I'm clamping it. I'm gonna put about 20 PSI on it, which for AE10, that's it asks for uh, pressure in the range of five to 20 PSI and with these clamps and that size of rubber pad and metal plate, uh, we end up around 20 PSI. So really at this point now, it's a waiting game. So we've got the epoxy applied, we've got the gauge back over, we got the pressure applied. Now we could put it inside of an oven, uh, cure it faster if we wanted to, or like in our case, we're just gonna let it sit and let it cure at room temperature and it's gonna take about six hours. In our case, we're just gonna let it sit overnight. So that brings us really to the end of this part of the installation. Uh, we've got the strain gauges, uh, we got the epoxy applied, the strain gauges are clamped up, and really now it's just a waiting game. We're gonna be waiting for this epoxy to cure. If you wanted to speed up that process, again, you could put it inside of an oven and elevate the temperature and cure this epoxy faster. In our case, we're just gonna cure it at room temperature, uh, and the minimum time for that is six hours. In our case, we're gonna let it go overnight. So we're back with our strain gauge installed on the battery. Uh, it's had a chance to sit overnight and allow the AE10 to uh, fully cure. So we're gonna remove the uh, spring clamp and then take off the metal plate and the rubber pad and expose the strain gauge and also that 50 ohm uh, nickel sensor. Uh, this afternoon, we're just gonna focus on the strain gauge and we're gonna uh, connect the strain gauge into our P3 strain indicator and recorder just to check the functionality of the strain gauge and make sure it seems to uh, be responding. Uh, but before we do that, we're gonna apply a little bit of protective coating over top of the strain gauge. We're also gonna inspect it. Now's a good time to do that. So I'm gonna take the tape and peel it directly back on itself, exposing the top side of the strain gauge as well as the temperature sensor. And I'll go ahead and remove that tape completely. Uh, there's another piece of tape on it as well and I'm gonna take that one off. That was the one that we put on to help us be able to get the 
the wires to kind of lay down on the surface as we're trying to apply the larger uh, piece of tape. And in general, a lot of times uh, tape works pretty well uh, for holding uh, wires down onto a surface. You know, if you've got like a really high centrifugal environment, uh, tape is probably not the best choice, but you know, for a static structural type application, you can certainly consider using it. Um, just doing an optical inspection at this point, you're checking to make sure you got the gauge in the right orientation. Um, this one's a three element rosette, so it allows us to solve for principal strains and direction uh, based off the data we get from the three element rosette. And at this point, I'd say it looks pretty good. So I'm gonna put a small dab of MCOAT C over top of the strain gauge and over top of the wiring. Just a little bit. I'm trying to leave the temperature sensor exposed because we're going to use that a little bit later. But just cover over top the gauge and put a good little drop or two over top of the wires to help. So I'm just going to put a little, little more of the MCOAT C over top of the strain gauge over top of the wires. And in general, if you give it about 30 minutes, it'll start to solidify to a point where it'll help to hold down those leads. Uh, this is the nickel temperature sensor. I'm going to leave that open at this point uh, because we're not quite ready to use it yet. Now this strain gauge is a three element rectangular style rosette, 350 ohms in resistance. Obviously a very, very small size. And we've got it connected into the micromeasurements model P3 strain indicator and recorder. And I've already taken the three conductor uh, Teflon insulated lead wire connected it into the P3 strain indicator. Now loading this battery is going to be kind of tricky. Really what we're looking for is more of a thermal loading. So we're, we've got our, our heat gun that we're going to use to warm things up a little bit. Not a lot, but just a little bit uh, just to kind of uh, get a response out of the strain gauge. I load it, maybe I bend it just a little bit if you watch. You can see the output change. I'm gonna try to twist it a little bit. If I twist it, grid one in the direction that I've got it shown, grid one should be uh, in compression and grid three should be in tension. And I think that's exactly what I'm seeing. I've got compression on one and tension on three. And if I do just the opposite, try to twist it back the other way, then the opposite ought to be true. And sure enough, we can see that. So if you were chasing after, what kind of assembly stresses do you put on this battery when you put it into a certain container or enclosure? You know, you'll find the strain gauges could tell you that. We're back to zero. And now we're just going to take the heat gun and warm it up. So all we're doing is thermally loading it, thermally being what we're getting out of the heat gun. And if you look at the strain gauge response, you can easily see that we're getting over 200 microstrain, just that quick and that simple. So if, you're, if your goal of your exercise is to measure, you know, what's happening to like in this case, a small battery as it starts to undergo thermal changes, strain gauges could help you answer that question. They could measure that expansion or contraction as you were to take it and undergo various uh, temperature changes. Matter of fact, we have a whole technical note dedicated to uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion measurements using strain gauges that's available on the website at www.micro-measurements.com. But there's a wide variety of where these strain gauges uh, you, that you may find them useful. And this is just another example. This is a, a very small battery package where we put a gauge on it and we can detect mechanical loads and we can also detect thermal loading of that structure. And strain gauges could be a useful tool that you use in your tool belt to help you find, maybe if you're having some issues, they can help you find you know, where those issues are occurring, either in production steps or maybe when a, 
a customer is actually using uh, the device. So uh, we've been able to show you that strain gauges could be used on a variety of different, uh, in a variety of different applications and products, like in this case, a battery, where you could measure the mechanical strain as well as the uh, thermal loading uh, of the device. So if you've got a maybe an internal process or a way in which your, your customer's using your product and you're trying to chase after uh, some measurements to try to determine what condition maybe causes a premature failure, uh, strain gauges can be a very useful tool to help you be able to find that. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about the strain gauges we used or this M-Bond AE-10 or you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. You can call us at 919-365-3800 and follow the prompts till you get to Applications Engineering. Or you'll also find a wealth of information on our website at www.micro-measurements.com. We thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us.